Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining today's webinar. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we will cover as many as we can at the end of the webinar. Please make sure that your volume is up and any large applications are closed on your computer or mobile device to ensure a smooth connection. This webinar is presented by Henry Schein Dental, and no CE credits are being offered for viewing today's presentation. I'm pleased to welcome back Dr. Jonathan Levine, a renowned dentist and prosthodontist in practice for nearly 30 years. Thank you, Dr. Levine, for being with us today. Take it away. Well, Adam, thank you. Thanks for organizing and, and having me back with Andrea. Thank you to Andrea. It's a pleasure to be here to share a uh, thinking that has developed over the last uh, 25 plus years. Um, you know, the the digital workflow and digital dentistry and this new technology can be very overwhelming. Um, so what I'd like to do in the next 45 minutes is to review the fundamentals of aesthetic and functional dentistry as it relates mostly to aesthetics and really to see how we can integrate kind of our digital workflow uh, into the whole design. So from scanning, designing to manufacturing, to make things more efficient and more effective. So that's my goal. Uh, we use the expression that digital dentistry is not gonna make you a great dentist. Um, a continuous learning and constant studying of the fundamentals will. And based on these fundamentals of what we do in these building blocks, if we layer in this new technology, whatever new technology is coming down, whether it's a laser or it's a new scanner or it's a new CAD CAM machine, there's an opportunity to make us better uh, than we were without it and more efficient. So let me uh, take us a little bit about what, what, what I do. I'm involved uh, in a couple different things just to give you context. Our practice, uh, we call JBL New York City. We have about 24, 25 people. Um, I've started a couple different companies. Glow Science is one of them. We have whitening therapeutic products and then we have a foundation that really builds culture for my practice and for the people who come on our missions. And most of them are in Eleuthera these days and very involved with my uh, alma maters, both, uh, both NYU PG Pros and uh, where I've uh, been an associate professor and help run the advanced aesthetics program and uh, Boston University. But before I really jump in, I want to just share with everybody on this, the concept of Ikigai. And Ikigai is a very interesting thing. And having done dentistry and been in the profession and, and in an entrepreneurial bent within our profession, um, this resonates for me. And I want to share it with everybody. I'd love you to kind of pick it up. But it's an interesting concept. It's, it's the reason for being. It's the, it's the Japanese call, the reason for being, Ikigai. And it's where what you're passionate about, what you're really, really good at, what you get paid for, and what the world needs, where that all comes together, that's your purpose. And I think it's a great thing to think about because as professionals, we're so focused on the care of our patients and building our team and our practice and working collaboratively with a, with a specialist um, and then balancing that with life. Um, I think it's a, a, just a great concept for us to embrace. So I, it's a great read. Really great read. Here's my team, um, most of everybody. Uh, many of them, we've been together a couple of decades and a half, and uh, especially the, the, the guys with the uh, whiter hair. And, uh, and it's a great team. I'm very blessed. Paula with the, with the Pearls, who's still in Finland, coming back in a few weeks, was my first dental assistant. Um, I believe deeply in building culture and continuous learning and challenging each other and holding each other accountable to build a, a great team. Let me show you a little bit about the practice just to give you some idea of what our patients, uh, when they come in, what they see. Thank you. 
What you see is a, a motivational mock-up from a design of a 3D printed model. I'll show you that today. And then showing the patient kind of what she can expect, we get this excited, emotional uh, feeling from our patient, uh, which goes a long way. It's so much easier than having to talk about things. We can show them and then we can get that feedback, of course, as that first move of testing our idea and our hypothesis. So we'll talk uh, quite a bit. But first I want to tell you about my patient Lenny, who when I came back from Africa on a mission with our foundation, our Glow Good Foundation, he says, Doc, you gotta come help my people. Where's your people, Lenny? He says, in Eleuthera. And I go down to Eleuthera with my wife and there's Stace, and we're checking out the people there. I'm realizing that they have rampant de decay, periodontal disease, no access to care. And I said, Lenny, we're coming back. And we did come back. And we've gone back uh, for the last five years, Last December 9th, we were there with 110 people. And here's a quick little video. And it's something that I believe that as hard as we work, we, we, uh, we can do well and do good and do well at the same time. It's, it's very exciting. I have folks there from my aesthetic program and my practice. And, um, and there's Lenny. This community is my home. My people here be able to have the care that they should have, that every human being should have and i've been very fortunate to find partners with dr ravine and his wife stacy and we have an amazing family the whole globe the team we would drive around in his jeep and just ask people on the road he would know them and we saw that they needed the most basic care so we teamed up our organizations the Glow Good foundation and lenny's let love rule giving them access to dentistry, giving them access to the education about how to take better care of their oral health. We have the ability, one place at a time, to really make a difference. And hopefully we'll be back in January when things calm down. But I show this because when I go down there, I'm so proud of our profession, what we do, how we change people's lives. And it's, it's, it's truly inspiring uh, to see the people that come down there. Um, small, the, a lot of the concepts we're going to go over right now, um, you can get this book on Amazon if, if you enjoy what I'm talking about. But Small Design and what we do and uh, have a number of great writers, the chapters, uh, Dr. Jeff McClendon, my partner here, um, Newton Cardoza, Dr. Frank Salenza did our aligners. But, you know, what we believe is that there's an integration, of course, of aesthetics and function. And we've tried to develop protocols and systems so that we can do that very efficiently. So that's what we cover in the book, uh, Aesthetic Dentistry. So dentistry, it's a new day and it's a tremendous platform for innovation as we are all seeing it. And it's moving very quickly. It's moving quickly where we have the ability to scan design and manufacture, whether it's aligners, which we make our own aligners in the office, whether it's night guards, whether it's restorations, one day restorations or inlays and crowns. And we have my two ceramists who've been with me over 20, 24 years. Um, we do a lot of Emacs and zirconium, and of course, implant process. Um, we work as a team. So we have two digital technicians and three more of the, on the analog side but it is a wonderful platform for, for innovation. It's a very exciting day. So when we think about, it, and I ask the question, well, what do you do? You know, what exactly do, you know, we, we, we do, we have an option and we figured this out kind of 15, 20 years ago, because we could just be focused on fixing teeth, but we really could be focused on transforming people's lives and change, transforming their smiles, whether we're making a denture, implant reconstruction, ceramic veneers, or just getting our patients healthy because they have periodontal disease, um, we can transform people's lives and their smiles and we can make them healthier. And, and that's the place I think we all wanna be. So we're living through this digital revolution, we really are. And as we went, and in my own practice, we still live in analog, which is you waxing up and waxing up for Emacs. We also live in a digital world. So we're, we're kind of somewhere in the middle of those. When you compare the two, it's very interesting. You can see some of the advantages of, di of digital. But the bottom line is we want to maximize the aesthetic and functional potential by doing digital. And what I mean by that 
is when we can do digital, we can really be copying natural tooth form, okay? We can be scanning natural tooth form. We're using that natural tooth form both for smile design and single restoration. Both can give us facially driven treatment planning. We've been doing facially driven treatment planning for 20 years plus in aesthetic dentistry. But the interdisciplinary and the communication is better. And the integration of aesthetic and functions when you're working with ceramists that understand the software, the digital workflow is very impressive. The natural tooth form advantage over a technician just waxing from their imagination is levels above as we can copy exactly natural tooth form and concept we call small donated that. Uh, hopefully I'll show you that uh, case that we did that. The traditional technician we know, you know, it's magnificent veneers we can do, those pathic layered, um, but the communication is somewhat analog. Um, you don't have as much control of the collaborative approach like you have in the digital world. And combinations of these two also works. It doesn't have to be one or the other because very specific cases still, I believe, get handled extremely well in an analog world, but we might smile design the case digitally, okay? Or we're doing the aligners digitally. So it's a, it's a combination, but it's the concept of scanning, designing, and manufacturing, and going from the physical articulator to, to a virtual or a digital one. Great. So the learning objectives that I wanna go through in the next 40 minutes, is really to show you how we think about integration of aesthetics and function. This is a concept that my partner in crime here, Dr. Jeff McClendon, we've been together for 25 years and he's at the aesthetic program. I handed the program off to Mike Galizio, who's did an amazing job there for the last year and a half. Um, got, of course, blocked by COVID, but they'll be back. But the, a lot of the concepts that uh, came out of what we call the feline, the functional aesthetic edge, came out of the collaboration of Dr. Mack and myself. This three-step analysis is something I've been uh, working on, and it's very Peter Dorsonian, who for many of us are mentors of the three-step analysis and this aesthetic evaluation form we created uh, as much as 25 years ago. We we're, about, uh, we're at version seven. And then we're gonna look at the digital revolution and small design and integrating uh, uh, digital workflow into our practices. So we like to call this the transdisciplinary approach. You know, medicine and dentistry is very siloed, either separate, but also within. And so we have to say to ourselves, how do we connect the dots and how do we forecast where we want to go? How do we envision and visualize these cases and work backwards from that? Well, the person who I have unbelievable respect for and has been a mentor and a dear friend of mine is Rick Robley. And he wrote the book in 94, Interdisciplinary Dental Facial Therapy. It's still an incredible book today. Rick works in Fayetteville, Arkansas, constantly reinventing himself. And it's the ability to create software now that allows a platform of everybody talking to each other, which is truly exciting. There's definitely a paradigm shift going on. And the bottom line with digital dentistry is like anything, we have to know our fundamentals. And we really start with kind of the philosophy of practice of, of how we think of our practice. And we like to talk about structural and anatomical harmony, functional harmony, and of course, the biology, the optimum oral health, health structure, function, and biology. We learned a lot of this, of course, in dental school and after at different levels of, of training. So when we look at, and we, this is from our book, but basically the concepts is from both Mark Brose and, and Dr. Lee, the concept of the biological model and the neutral zone from Earl Pound and the musculature all coming together. We'll talk about this four millimeters of over by two millimeters of overjet, the biological model, because when you have worn teeth, we have to get back to some type of anchor that we can hold on to as we think of visualizing these cases, whether it's a diagnostic wax up from wax or whether it's off, off of a, a digital wax up from your virtual articulate. Of course, the position of those teeth in the neutral zone of the lips and how the lips get supported by proper incisal ledge position, we'll, 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 we're definitely gonna be talking about um, throughout the next 30, 35 minutes. So, Structure function biology in dental school, and when I went to dental school, that's what we learned. But there's a new way of thinking, and the new way of thinking 
is that structure and function biology is preceded by aesthetics. And that's what we talk about. This was a great concept originally from Frank Spear um, in 2006 and Dr. Lee. But we want to understand the, the, the most important tooth in the smile, which is the incisal edge of the central incisor. So let's talk about that a little bit more. The functional aesthetic edge or phi line is where it all comes together. You have the aesthetic surface, the facial surface, you have the phonetic surface, the incisal edge, and you have the functional palate. And as you bring that together, that kind of linkage, we set up this, this phi line. So when we think about diagnostics, where we're always going is where is the incisal edge of the central incisor? Because that's where everything comes together. So aesthetics drives our thinking, not structure, function, biology, and then aesthetics, but aesthetics is really the first thing we do. And then we follow the structure, function, and, and structure, function, biology. So building a system for aesthetic predictability by doing a system and a process will build a necessary foundation for us to visualize these cases, figure out how to get where we're starting, identify where we are, and figure out the treatment plan to get there. Okay, so we very Peter Dorsonian and Panky, and I was fortunate to be able to be exposed early on in my career after I did my prosthodontics. But you want to identify the problem, visualize where you want to go. So after you know where you are and know where you want to go, as Pete Dawson would always say, getting there is easy. You choose the appropriate technique, and the appropriate technique is always kind of the most conservative technique that fits our patient that we're customizing this for, and this sets the necessary foundation that, that we need to treat our patients at an extremely high level. How are we gonna do it? We're gonna do it with a systematic approach. Okay, and what I wanna to introduce to you is the, this concept that we first published this over 25 years ago, but it's this three-step analysis. And this three-step analysis basically takes us through an aesthetic evaluation form, which is a checklist. Go in a cockpit, you're driving a plane, flying a plane, excuse me, not driving a plane, flying a plane, you're going through a checklist of the same thing. We see our patients, whether it's a simple situation or more complicated situation, we go through our aesthetic evaluation form, which I'm gonna show you. It's been published in about, about four or five things, four or five places uh, in, the, in the last 10 years, and also in our book, and in Steve Chu's book, and Goldstein's book in the beginning. So that's the aesthetic evaluation form. And then from that form, it allows us to identify the problem and figure out where's the gum line and where's the incisal edge, ideally, as it fits the face. This is all about facially generated treatment plan. Because how high the smile is, where, what you're showing, you're in relationship to the face and the dental facial structures, the lips and the teeth, is so critical to success. So we do a diagnostic wax up, we can do an analog through wax up, or we can do it now digitally. And then we want to show the patient what we're thinking. This is not a completed, completed wax up, but this allows us to show the patient what we're thinking so we could share it with them, and most importantly, to get them excited. So identify the problem, aesthetic evaluation form, record gathering, mounted models, or do it digitally. And here's the aesthetic evaluation form. It's gone on multiple iterations and new iterations for last year. But it basically asks some very important questions. And of course, this is very much in, the, in, in kink at keeping with Dr. Ron Goldstein, which is asking open-ended effective questions. If there was anything you could change about your smile, what would it be? And then separate from that is to categorize our patients because a lot of them have a vision of, hey, I want them perfect or I want them very natural. And you want to figure that early on. And we, that really is very helpful as we think about what shade we're gonna use for, let's say, the mock-up. Is it gonna be very bleach-like color or is it gonna be maybe more in the 1M1 or B1 shape? We're gonna have perfect imperfections of naturalness or we're gonna have more of perfect symmetry. So we like to help categorize this, this, this information. And as Goldstein was for the first question, Lloyd Miller, who was, was an amazing aesthetic dentist and I was fortunate to hear him at the Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry in the late 90s, came up with the, these questions. And um, they're, really, they're really great, we put into the form. And then we do a facial analysis. We look at parallelism, we look at lips, full thick, thin, we look at nasolabial angle sideways, so is it a convex or concave profile? And allows us to generate this facially, uh, facially generated treatment plan. So lip at rest, we know that every decade, 40, 50 to 60, the lip falls a millimeter. 
So if we, and we, we also know, know from Bill Arnett's work from the Subnase Alley to the inferior, inferior border of the uh, upper lip, you're about 18 to 22 millimeters. So now on the form, we're measuring the upper lips and we wanna know how much tooth exposure is there with the lipid rest. Well, if a person's at 30 and shows about three millimeters, Vic and, Vic and Bruno study for a woman, and you have a 45, 48, 50 year old that wants to look like a 30 year old, we wanna show that amount of tooth exposure. And we have new concepts that, that we've developed here, but we wanna understand where is that lipid rest? Because remember, through this aesthetic evaluation form, we're gonna determine where's the gum line and where does the incised ledge go? Because from there, we're gonna build everything. Okay, and then we look at smile line and we look at facial aesthetics and symmetry and nasolabial and rickets equine. Then we take like a camera zooming in face, dental facial, and then dental. So we look at the teeth and the lips, high smile line, vertical horizontal components, buccal corridors, asymmetry versus symmetry, midline position, all of it. And it allows us to gather information that our technician needs. And then we also look at the micro aesthetic elements when needed. But the most important thing which is coming up is where are we going to put the gum line? And here's a, more of a micro aesthetic elements and there's micro aesthetic element. But where are we going to put the gum and where we're going to, the gingiva and where are we going to put the incisor legs? And so how long is that tooth? And we do that and I'll show you a number of cases. We do it with flowable right there, chair side. We measure with the digital caliper. And that information goes to our technician, whether for analog or for digital waxing. Great. So let me keep going. So now that we've gathered the information, we know where the gingival margin is, we know where the incisor of the ledge is going to be, so we know that what the tooth is going to be. Let's say it's going to be 10.5 millimeters. It's a high smile line. You don't want to go more than 10.5 millimeters. We're thinking to ourselves, okay, how are we going to visualize? And now the fun begins because we've established the feline. I'll show you cases where you know, you're dealing with vertical dimension change and you got to get that biological model of overbite and overjet. But you're visualizing, let's say, a simple kind of position where you have a lot of worn incisor ledge and maybe you're going to do it with bonding off an index or maybe you're going to do the ceramic veneers or whatever. You won't really want to know where's that incisor ledge going, but you want to build it in relationship to the facial aesthetic. Build it in relationship to the facial aesthetics. And so at this point, I'm going to call out a colleague of mine who literally changed my life about how I think especially as it relates to digital dentistry, digital workflow, and motivating our patient. And that is a, a gentleman, is a technician and a dentist from Brazil, from Sao Paulo. He's seven generations of dentists, his father, his father's father, and that's Christian Coachman, who has built a company called Digital Smile Design. I can't say enough about Christian. And about four or five years ago, him and I uh, got to know each other and did some courses together. And I was able to integrate digital dentistry because of his impact, the huge impact. So you visualize, and then what you're looking at is a diagnostic wax up on the left side with wax, but then in the other ones, you're looking at smile design, regardless whether you're doing it analog with the bench top technician waxing, or you're doing off a computer, so you're using, let's say, DSD software, and there's other softwares that you could be using, we're creating an index. And this index uh, then allows us to mock that up in the mouth. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like. Once we can visualize and visualize with the patient, we take video and we show the patient, get them excited. Now we choose appropriate technique to get there. And oftentimes that's when the patient's excited and you figure out about what you're gonna do, you can show them what you're doing. Now the real work starts because now we're looking at more at full wax ups, whether it's virtual or whether it's analog and really figuring out the occlusion. But the first thing we wanna do is is kind of figure out that aesthetics. Remember what we talked about, aesthetics before structure, function, and biology. Great. So let's keep rocking. Now let me show some cases that are gonna illustrate what we're talking about. Here's Diane, high smile line. I wanna show you her, her case. High smile line, gummy smile, a lot of worn incisor of ledges. Let's take a bit of a deep dive. And this is how we do presentation at the aesthetic program. And this is how we think about kind of a, you know, um, a way of systematizing what we're doing. So when you look at the form, there's a facial analysis part, dental facial, phonetic, dental, occlusal, and size determination, and then we're waxing up. So the first thing is aesthetic evaluation form. We ask the patient if there was anything you could change about your smile, what would it be? And she says the shape, the way they look, the way they look in general. Okay, gotcha. We keep probing, but the, basically what she said was everything. 
Then the second question is, if you could have the perfect smile, straight, white, perfect, or clean, healthy, natural, a lot of times I explain it, and I never say a third option. Straight, white, perfect, and everything's symmetric, everything's right, or very natural, these perfect imperfections, what would you like? For the people who say, I like it one way or the other, great. But sometimes you have people say, well, I want them natural, but I want them white. And that's your third category. And that's a great way to do it because everybody's thinking left or right, you know, very binary answers. And then you can introduce that third option. So this is how we look at interpupillary line and midline, commissural line, and we're looking at symmetry versus asymmetry. And it's actually quite symmetrical. We look at Ricketts E-plane. So the, when there's somewhat of a vertical dimension change, a lot of times you get, you know, uh, auto rotation of the mandible, a little overclosure, and you start getting that concave profile. We get a concave profile, the concept is how do we build it out and down and get better eversion of those lips and support of the lip from the teeth support the lips like scaffolding. And, have, and so we're already thinking about that because it was a convex profile, the opposite way we think about downsizing the teeth, which would be the opposite of this. So let's take a look at the lips. It's average on the upper lip. The lower lip is, is, is full, looks great. You can see the exposure with the incisor the ledge. You can see the amount of wear and you can see a very high smile. All right, so we're starting to develop our thinking. We're going through our analysis. And basically the fundamentals of aesthetics is our foundation. Understanding our fundamentals of aesthetics allows us to identify and visualize and choose. And the, the combination of the facial surface, the phonetic edge and the palatal surface for occlusion all comes together here. Because when you have this much wear, the anterior coupling is missing. The wear in the front is gonna cause problems in the back because there's what we all know about mutually protected occlusion and the front teeth exclude the back teeth and the back teeth by definition support the front teeth in a vertical direction, we call them verticalizing contact. So as we look at this, we go through our three-step analysis, we look at the patient, we see we have wear on the teeth, you can see she's missing a second molar, uh, wear on the premolars, we're starting to think, well, there might be some compensatory eruption, possibly some loss of vertical dimension. But remember, we start with aesthetics. So using a little bit of flowable, there's the flowable on the left side, I start developing inside the ledge, bringing out a little bit and putting the gum line where I wanna put the gum line. If you look at the digital caliper, it says 10.5. There's an inviolate rule that I have learned that on a high smile line, you never wanna go longer than 10.5 on the central incisor because the teeth will end up getting too big. Okay and 10 to 10.5, and we know this from Markowitz's work, is about the length. In central size, it could be anywhere from 10 to 12, but 10 in balance, high smile line, it works extremely well and very well balanced. So that's what we were looking at. That was our determination. And now we take a bite registration, and we were looking, a lot of times we'll take this incisal edge position, and if we're looking to change slightly to restore vertical dimension, we'll use the, this also has a Lucia jig. So it's a jig plus a feed line. So we call it the feed jig to actually help set the registrations to now do your waxing. Okay, hope everybody got that. So our diagnostic wax up, we did this for the first step, which was to create a 3D printed model of a design. And this is straight digital smile design. This is Christian Coachman, Francis, his brother and their whole team that have figured this out over the last three, four years and it built just, just an incredible help to us as aesthetic dentists. They have, now have it at, uh, on an app that's AI driven. So please visit their, their website if you have a chance at DSD, DSD.com. But anyway, there's the template and the template is basically central lateral canine, premolars following the continuous occurrence, all the things we know about aesthetics, 3D printed model. And then we take that 3D printed model, what do we do? We make an index. Special way to do an index, but you're basically relining a silicon. And, and here she is, we mock it up, we put some type of composite resin, provisional material, could be, could be any of them, uh, 3M Pro Temp, Integrity, and, and we have the mock-up. The mock-up goes in, we never show the patient a mirror, okay, never. So we show them either on the big screen I have, oh, or, or and that's me making a lot of noise. And she's looking at herself on the iPhone that I took pictures of her and I have video of her and I'm stopping the video along the way to show her what she could look like. Super excited. When do we begin? Then when she says, when do we begin? Now the real work starts, mounted model, diagnostic wax up because we were 
restoring a little bit of vertical dimension and diagnostically waxing up the case. And I ended up uh, doing uh, the, uh, we did the smile design digitally, as you can see. And then we did some of the occlusion uh, from an analog perspective. So there is the smile design. We made a surgical stent because we were raising the gum line. We realized we had to raise the gum line. Remember my flowable simulated that we were raising the gum line as I put flowable over the gum line, I measured right to 10.5. Well, when we did the smile design, we knew exactly where we'd go, surgical stent. Perio was done by Dr. Frank Salenzen, so well done. And then um, we have the final case. And here's our patient. It's very much like the, uh, the mock-up. And here's the, here's the final. So we did a occlusal rehabilitation, working on the teeth that we had to work on, improving uh, overbite, overjet. Here she is on a big smile, much improved uh, rickets E-plane and nasolabial angle and support. And that's Diane that we did both from a digital and, and an analog perspective. But the excitement we create, the wow effect that Christian Coachman always talks about was the motivational mock-up that came though from the ability to do a three-step analysis to identify the problem and then visualize where we're going to go using the feline of the incisor ledge. Let me show you another case. So me to listen. have the perfect smile. And here's what, our nav what bar at the top. Like? Effective questions we first. Words, here's our system. We're using. What we adjectives. Say? I'm asking her white, if you have the perfect white, smile, what would it be? White. Bigger teeth. Bigger where teeth. would you want bigger teeth? On uh, the front. In the yeah. front, you want bigger okay. teeth. Okay. The ginger How about the edge? We're gonna get rid of some of of the teeth. A little bit of grayness you have at the edge? Yes. Right. Beautiful. And how about how about you thought that there was a little bit gummy, right? Raise yeah. the gum line a little. Too gummy, for sure. A little too gummy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And how important is a smile for you? Very important. Why is it important? Because I'm a model, so this is a moneymaker. <laughs> <laughs> I love this line. She's a model. And it's her, her money maker. And the truth is, we're in the smile business, all of us. We're on the smile business. We're in the best business we can have. We create beautiful smiles for our patients. And it's an exciting profession, especially today more than ever. So here she is laughing. But I want to show her what we, we're thinking. But first, we got to identify the problem. And we go through this nav bar. Facial analysis, basically the aesthetic evaluation form. Facial analysis, dental, facial, phonetic. It's in the book. You just copy them off could also make a digital digital version version of it but you can get to the point where you're going to determine the incisal edge position so let me show you how we did that first thing is through the um, facial aesthetics we're looking into pupillary parallel lines great next we're going to look to see midline is it centering next lip at rest how much tooth exposure and she's got great tooth exposure and then we look at nasolabial and we look at rickets e plane a little bit concave, a little bit, a little bit, but you can see the lip at rest pretty good with incisal edge position, right? Okay. Um, now um, we do um, phonetics. Um, 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 you want to see the incisal edge to the lower lip? Say um, 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 And just run them through it, F and S, and make sure that the sounds are right and where's the incisal edge in relationship to the wet dry line. Is, is it the central's torqued in? Does she have a lot of uh, lingual torque, where maybe if she had better support and, and supported the lips better, they would have more of that voluminous, you know, especially on women, more of a, a voluminous lips. So three to four millimeters in size of lead exposure is very good. But the teeth look small. The teeth look small because they're a little bit set back. And we saw that in the rickets seat plane. That was a concave profile. High smile line, and you can see what's happening here with the asymmetries. High smile line, uh, convex curve and not touching. Great. Let's keep going through the aesthetic evaluation 50, form. 50, 51, Here comes 51, a little more fanatic. 52, 52, 53, 53. I love using video because we can always go back to it and I go over it with the technicians with our service. 61, 61, 62. You can see the size of the position is quite good. 64. Torqued in a little bit. Okay. So here's the close-up, the dental view, when facial dental, facial dental, and we can see the asymmetry of tooth number eight, the asymmetry of seven to 10, and all of a sudden we're saying, so all right, I kind of know what I want to do here. Also look at the papillas and look at the interproximal tissue. You can see how it's covering a lot of the teeth, making them look narrow and small, right? So 
what are we going to do? We go through our evaluation form. Let's see if this is moving. Asymmetry. Good. And I like to draw a lot of times, so I'll either draw or we have an iPad or we have a digital smile design and we start drawing exactly where I want to put the peak of the gingival seam on the centrals and the central height slightly lower in the lateral and of course even with the canine to the central and we use that for communication. For DSD the requirements are two or three pictures today because it's very very simple and you scan the mouth and you're, you're connecting the dots between the face and the scanned models. So that's our DSD requirements. Here I am we did this for an over the shoulder course that we did in my office with Christian and that's his brother who's in Madrid and it's when they had the small design center, uh, less about the software that they have today. And we were designing it together, working together for our course. And here's the, uh, here's the motivational mock-up. So from that design, digital small design, from the templating of all the rules of aesthetics of central lateral canine, height to width ratios, natural tooth form, the beauty of digital is we're using natural tooth form, 3D print, and then we make this index. It's a reline silicon index, great technique to do it. And then you carve up, you sculpt and scallop exactly the CEJs so that there's very little- All color. we gotta do is talk about last night. Here's a list of it because we used that in the case. And there she is with the mock-up. And you can see that the teeth are much simpler, like much more artist. dominant. <laughs> and <laughs> on video, <laughs> it's so great when you have this mock -up. If you look oh, up what is that area, a good one. Look at the <laughs> But if you, uh, you know, but as you see from a video, and that's why we want to show patients video either on a yeah, screen or an iPhone, it, it becomes very, very dramatic, very powerful. We went ahead, we trimmed the tissue off of a surgical stent, which came off of our design, and then we, we then let the tissue heal, and we prep. Here's the prep, here's the tooth number seven. You can see the tissue is still a little inflamed, but now we have everything kind of lined up properly. And we took her from the preps to provisionals. Provisionals, as we know, is a functional dress rehearsal. We made a couple of tweaks. And a lot of times the small design in the old days, they were a little bit too much, a little bit too much support. And we found ourselves always just kind of slightly modifying that. Here's the final case um, with the ceramic veneers, nice dominance on the, on the centrals. And she's, uh, you know, was extraordinarily happy. And we had a very happy patient. And there's my Pal Christian and Alyssa, uh, fun case. So let me show you Rick, and we're doing great. I'm gonna run through this, but I was telling Christian, I said, I don't know, Christian, I think my patient, my technicians do a better job with analog. I, I've seen CAD CAM and I don't know, they don't have the life that I think we can get, you know, and, and I really didn't meet great um, digital technicians at that time. This was three years ago. So this was a, two years ago, we did a course at NYU um, with Ken Beecham at CE. And Christian had the idea he's gonna bring in five of the top CAD CAM technicians in the world for this course. And that's what we did. And here's Rick, who I met. And here he is right through the nav bar, effective questions, facial analysis, dental, facial, dental, determining the incisal ledge, symmetry versus asymmetry. And you can see, we can see plane, concave profile. What does that tell you? We gotta build out and out and sure enough, you know, cause you, you don't have that lip support. And that's just a general thinking of where you're gonna go. So here's Rick. you could Rick. change your smile and kind of the story about- if you could change your, your smile. smile. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, a long time ago, I had a really bad dentist that pulled out some of these teeth and uh, I developed a lot of um, subconsciousness about smiling and it really affected me through high school and uh, stuff like that. If I could change anything about my smile, it would just be uh, to have a, a, a correct bite so I stop wearing down the insides of my teeth and for it just to look natural. Beautiful. So clean, healthy, and natural. Yeah. That, that would be amazing. If you establish that and you ask your patients the effective questions and they tell you everything. We all know that, right? We all know that. Okay. So here's what he is with the lipid rest showing a little bit over a millimeter, probably could show a little bit more. And we wanted to create a bit of an overbite over jet as the biological model. Remember this number, four, four millimeters of overbite, two millimeters of over jet on the horizontal. That is our biological model. That's where we want to go to. So we did that with some flowable. Here he is, kind of a pseudo class three. 
And as we look at that, you know, we're going to do orthodontics, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. You first got to visualize where we want to go and grow, go backwards from it. Because you could be moving teeth into position, you could be doing aligners, you could be doing aligners plus, you know, restoring the tooth mass that got lost from the grinding. So it depends. But we start the same way. We determine the feline, which is the functional aesthetic edge. And this is where we're also using this aesthetic edge for also a vertical dimension position, okay? Because he is so pseudo class three, he kind of auto rotated the mandible because he's missing some back teeth and spacing. And so we use this technique with flowable. We got him to about 11 millimeters of length. He didn't have a high smile line. And then we built out the overbite overjet and there you see the overbite overjet and we take a registration at that vertical dimension we, which we are looking to get overbite overjet. And, th and that's how we figure out our vertical. We wax from there. We do our digital smile design so that we can have a 3D printed model to show the patient, to get them excited, that wow result. Then once they say, yes, I'm excited, now the hard work begins. I'll say that a thousand times because now we've really got to figure things out. Here's the smile design, great from the templating. You know, this was based on the aesthetic of our form and kind of the shapes is very natural tooth forms. You can look at the laterals and how they're kind of sloped in so beautifully and big, great mesial line angles. The software that they were employing, and this is what we did this in Madrid with uh, Francis Coachman, um, Christian's brother who ran the Smile Design Center. We also were setting up the occlusion on the virtual articulator. So there's the virtual articulator in the face. It's very interesting. And here's the mock-up. And there we are in the course and there's that beautiful smile. To show you what we can do with small donators and these are natural tooth forms from the library, I use my pal Lenny Kravitz's smile because he's got a great smile. Who doesn't love Lenny Kravitz? And said, oh, what's that gonna look like? So we wanted to show the people in the course how we can literally transfer a smile. So we can take a, 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 a young woman, 25 years old, and their mother, 62, wants to get a reconstruction, she loves her smile. And we could literally scan it and we could mock it up in the mouth and that could be the forecasting for the provisional and of course then the final. So very exciting with digital dentistry, digital workflow. Here's the vertical dimension position. Here's, we put PMMA provisional to set the posterior occlusion. And then for the course, we did the preparations wrapped around uh, as much minimal tooth structure as possible. Here's the um, design. So here's from the virtual articulator and you can see what exactly done, but you're basically scanning. So we scanned that and we took impressions. So we had both, we had five technicians there. And I'll introduce you to the five technicians because each technician was gonna use a different technique of CAD CAM. Emax, zirconium, different levels of zirconium, layered. So it was really cool. So here's the virtual articulator. Let me, let me keep rocking here. And here's the provisionals. On the lower for the course, I set up um, kind of a mock-up from the virtual articulator just so I can set incisal, lower incisal edge position so I can set the overbite over jet. And we, the technicians were just doing the upper veneers. They were uh, about eight veneers. And then I finished his lower at a later time for him. So here's the provisionals and here's the, the uh, direct mock-up. That's, that's all plastic on the lower also. That's just provisional. And we're creating the overbite over jet. This is Rick. Here's the CAD cam. Let me introduce you to you. Of course, there's the CAD cam. This is video from Andre Acevedo, one of the technicians who's from Spain. Here's Mark Dixon here from New York. He was here. Rafael Sandrich, incredibly talented ceramist out of Miami, who does the scoop technique. Antonio Corradini, who did the zirconia beautifully. He did it a couple different ways and he did some of his own shapes, and Andre Acevedo, another super talented. So Christian brought all these guys over. I tried in all five sets, and the most amazing thing was that Rick, the patient, was listening in the back of the room because we didn't know who we were going to insert. Dixon, Boradini, Andre Acevedo, or Sandwich. And sure enough, when he heard the most natural was Raphael Sandwich's with the scoop technique, that's what we used. And here's the scoop technique with the beautiful texturing and size of ledge. They scoop the back of the Emacs and they put color and then they bake some porcelain to close it up. You see an incredible special effects at the incisor ledge. Just beautiful, incredible technician. So there he is with the plastic on the lower, final provisional, uh, final veneers on the upper, decided to 
two cement Raphael's. There he is, Rick's super happy. He's a great chef. I get to see him um, number number of uh, number of different ways. So when you uh, just to kind of wrap this up, and I want to leave um, a couple of minutes. There's some clinical tech takeaways that I want us to think about. Aesthetics and functions, they work together. We say they're two sides of the same coin. They're integrated. So our Smile Design book is all about the integration of aesthetics and function. That's the title. It's Smile Design, but integration of aesthetics and function. They're integrated through the feline because that's where the linkage, the convergence of the aesthetic edge and phonetic edge and the palo surface all comes together. That's where diagnosis, that's where diagnosis starts. We start with the incisal the ledge, then we follow with the structure function and biology. The three-step analysis allows us to identify where we are, exactly what we learned 40 years from Dawson, 30, 40 years ago. You visualize where you wanna go, exactly. If I know where I am and if I know where I wanna go, getting there is easy in the words of Pete Dawson. And now we have a systematic approach to diagnose we created a static evaluation form that really allows us in a checklist in a very, very, um, very easy manner, really, because it's, it's seamless. And you do the same thing. You go facial, dental, facial, dental, and you determine your gingival margin, size, and the length of your tooth. It helps you then facilitate your treatment plan. It is necessary, of course, for us to really consistently and constantly keep building on our fundamentals and focus on our fundamentals. Because whether you're doing an analog or digital, at the end of the day, that's what works. What digital is going to do is going to make us more efficient. Digital revolution, smile design. I do more aligners in my office than I, and, and orthodontics than ever before because it becomes so well integrated. It's not like I'm sending a patient somewhere and I don't see the patient for a few months and we don't have great communication. Communication is maximized because the digital workflow is all under one roof. So it creates efficiency and effectiveness. Of course, there is a learning curve, a learning curve of the workflow. But for us, we always want to constantly be learning and challenging ourselves. I think that's what it's all about. Here I am um, in my sixth decade, and I'm more excited about dentistry than ever before. And I do other things, but everything does connect in my world. It keeps me very Let's excited. Let's make believe a stranger is on an elevator with you and asks, what do you do for a living? It's up to you to know how to respond. You may say I'm a dentist, or you may say I transform people's lives by bringing their most beautiful smile to life. Together, we will help inspire our profession to meet the needs of the 21st century, challenge the status quo, to drive disruption and reinvention. So I show you that because I was very honored to do the commencement at BU in 2017. But I, I think it's something for all of us to think about in our profession, to adopt this creative mindset where we're constantly reinventing what we do and we get better and better at what we do. It keeps things fresh. It keeps us excited about the profession that we spend so much time and effort to become experts. So thank you so much for having me here. Uh, Adam, I'm going to wrap on that. And thank you. And if anybody ever wants to reach out to me, um, Jonathan had jblnyc.com. Uh, of course, uh, you know, we're on the internet and that Dr. John Levine is my, uh, is Instagram. Okay. Let me, let me escape that. Awesome. All right. Well, we have about 10 minutes left. If anyone has any questions for Dr. Levine, um, I actually have one. So you shared a couple of cases with us. Um, what's, is there like an average timeline in terms of duration for a case like that you showed us? Yeah, um, you know, depending on this, the case, because if it's the mo most of the work is done up front, right? This, just let's talk about kind of a very straightforward aesthetic and you're figuring out inside the ledge position, but the structure function of biology is good. It's strong. And you figured that out. And then it's showing the patient, getting them excited. It's then making sure your wax up works from an occlusal standpoint, overbite, over chat, you know, proper disclusion, mutually protected occlusion, all these things that we hold very dear for the fundamentals of occlusion. But then it's pre prepping, provisionalizing. And of course, with veneers, we do something called the APT technique and we put the 
mock up back in and we prep that and we do minimally invasive dentistry, take impressions or usually we take custom tray impressions plus scans so the technicians have both. Patients come back with the provisionals in and that's the dress rehearsal. And we're videotaping them in the provisionals. We're talking about color and size of ledge position. I didn't really cover that that much, but that is the time to really go to school on these provisionals. So it's two long appointments of the provisional side and then the insert, but it's bookended by the diagnostic work, information gathering up front and the, and the interviewing when they have the provisionals, which is this information flow that started from day one with the first question we asked, which is if you could change your small, what would it be? And then put them into this classification of straight, white, perfect or clean, healthy, natural. So that's the simple one. The more complicated ones is whether we have implants, vertical dimension changes, and biological issues, because that's what moves cases out. In those cases, you know, if you're doing implants, you're adding about four to six months to the cases, depending on, you know, how many implants and all of that. You're dealing with periodontics, you know, and healing, that's about six to eight weeks. So it really depends on, on the level of the case. But what's interesting for everybody to know is we do the same system and process for diagnostic, whether it's simple and straightforward or if it's complicated. And, and, that, and that's, I think, the beauty of this checklist and this approach of the three-step analysis, because it allows you to just do that foundational thinking, identify, visualize, and choose the appropriate technique. And then we had a question. How long is your consultation appointment? Do you do the quick flowable that same day to get an idea of where you plan to go? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, it's all about building rapport as we know. And so we have kind of that rapport building session and, and really trying to understand the needs of the patient and asking some effective questions. But from then, from there, we're going for information gathering. So we're going through our aesthetic evaluation form. And I've been doing it this way for 25 years, I got to tell you. And I want to determine the incisor of ledge and flowable is just a great way with the digital caliper. Don't take away my digital caliper. Don't take away my flowable and don't take away my red pencil because that's how I know what my margins are. So on provisionals. So you can really determine right up front that information, but then the patient's coming back for them to then see themselves in both a motivational mock-up or let's just say it's a straight occlusion case and, and you know, you're not really dealing with, you know, you may be changing posterior crowns or maybe you're doing aligners, but you know, so there's that second appointment where you're going to show the patient what you're coming up with from a standpoint of identify, then visualize, because you want the patient to see what you're talking about. And then you work backwards and you cho choose the most appropriate technique to get there. And then in the appropriate technique, it's all transdisciplinary. It's all the way from orthodontics to periodontics to implantology to prosthodontics to whatever disciplines you need to converge to get to that patient to, the, to that high level, uh, you know, to, to the level they want to get to. And for us, that all happens in the rapport building up front. So the, the short answer to the question is I spent at least a half hour, 20 minutes, a half hour, just talking to the patient and understanding their mindset and where they're at and their history and where they've come from, because that's going to help me set things up. Great. Well, that's all I got for you. No other questions have come in. So thank you for your presentation. And of course, thank you to everyone for attending tonight's webinar. If you have additional questions pertaining to this topic, please don't hesitate to reach out to Dr. Levine, or you can email us at webinars at henryshine.com. As a thank you for attending, we will be sending out a link of today's recording in the coming week via email. On behalf of Henry Shine, I'd like to once again extend a thank you to Dr. Levine, and I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you so much, John. My pleasure. So long, everybody.